Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Shah. On behalf of CallWAS, I would like to welcome all of you to this webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. Today, we have another very interesting topic, and I'm really honored to welcome and introduce our distinguished guest speaker who is going to talk about the experience design, which is an amazing topic. So you will get the wonderful insights, the right information and knowledge about as we have an expert with us in today's session. So stay tuned because an amazing stuff are coming ahead in this session. So before we start, I would like to uh, thank the Kalwas for arranging such enlightenment sessions for their support and providing such a wonderful platform. The aim of the Kalwas is to give you the opportunity to interact with the world-renowned speakers, teachers, authors, researchers, experts, professionals, and businessmen to share their views, experiences, and tips which will create an impact and will enable you to learn new things and develop yourself in order to grow individually as well as uh, uh, to contribute to the world at large. As our slogan is, uh, come learn and share knowledge. So today we have very special guest. He is well-known personality in academia and industry. As he has a vast experience, we always see him on different platforms while contributing to the field and world. Moreover, through his great knowledge and wisdom, people are getting the right guidance and knowledge. Above everything, he, is, he always extends a helping hand and ready to share his knowledge. So let me introduce him formally. He is an adjunct professor of tourism management in the Sustainable Research Center, University of Sunshine Coast, Queensland, and adjunct professor in Edith Cowen University, Western Australia. Also adjunct professor in the University of Mataram, Lombok, Indonesia, and a visiting professor at Taylor's University, Malaysia. His research interests include the study of tourism experiences and destination management and marketing. He is a frequent speaker at academia and industry conferences. Moreover, he has over 300 academic publications, including 17 books. In addition to that, he has supervised 30 doctoral students to successful completion for their thesis. Moreover, he is uh, on the editorial board of 10 journals and a member of the International Association of China Tourism Scholars and a fellow of the Council for Australian Tourism and Hospitality Education. His Google Scholar citation are 10,974, which is wonderful. Last but not the least, he's a wonderful speaker, author, teacher, researcher, professional, and above everything, a great human being. So please help me in welcoming our guest, Professor Dr. Noel Scott, welcome again to Calvas platform and thank you very much for joining us, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Shah. It's uh, always a pleasure to be able to talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, it's really our honor and pleasure to have you. And we had a last uh, wonderful session with you. It was so enlightening session. A lot of people, they appreciated it and they requested it to have uh, another session with you and you are kind enough that you have given time for us uh, which is very valuable your time and your busy schedule we know it so once again thank you very much for that uh, and uh, let me give you the audience the reminder that uh, uh, prof dr noel scott will be presenting and he will leave the question uh, leave the time for question and answer session at the end of the session so you can email us or you can write in comment section so over to you prof Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Shah. And I will um, just now uh, share my screen. I've got to work out again how to do this. I know it. I've done it. Uh, here we are. And I pick that one. Okay, so you should be able to see my yes, screen no, now. Is that, uh, great. All right. Yes, wow. thank you. Thanks, Dr. Shah. So, so look, um, I, I'm i very interested in this topic um, and, and uh, amongst tourism researchers, there's a number of people who are um, doing work in this area. Um, for example, Professor Fessenmeyer uh, is a um, key person who's done a lot of work in this area, Dan Fessenmeyer. Uh, a whole a range of different people are interested in the topic of experiences and um that's because uh they wait a minute let me just see here um 
the the topic of experiences became uh, one that was of interest to to academics from about uh, 1970. Um, and and uh, I don't know if you've heard of the book Future Shock. Have you heard of that book, uh, Dr. Shah? It was a very um, uh, influential book, um, or well, well, back 50 years, but still it was quite influential. Have you have you heard about it? Uh, no, Prof. Uh, sorry. No, that's all right. But these so these people, Toffler and Toffler, they wrote a book which was talking about, uh, which was in 1970, and they, basically they were. Um, sociologists, I think, but they were they were talking about the future, or they were talking about the fact that the future, the the speed at which things were changing in society, and this is fifty years ago, was speeding up, and they they talked about all the changes that were going on in society. So, you know, uh, for many of the viewers today. The idea that um, you know we can use the internet and we can uh, travel globally, uh, or we used to be able to on aeroplanes, and all sorts of things are quite normal. But if you go back, f you know, fifty years to the this work, it was uh, they, they were what you might call today futurists. They were talking about the future, and what they said was. An economy is being created geared to the provision of psychic gratification. That is a process of psychologicalization um, where humans will strive for a better quality of life. Okay. Isn't that interesting? And, of course, today, if we go and look at the um, the literature, uh that we might see in some of the journals, especially in my area, tourism journals, they will talk a lot about um, quality of life and health and wellness and uh, transformational experiences, spirituality. So in some ways, what Toffler and Toffler were predicting has eh, arguably become more prominent in society. But the interesting thing is why? Why? What, what's driving these changes? So um, if you go up to, uh, if you look at the, the graph above that quote in green, the, the graph, you'll see a, a diagram that I've taken from a paper by Pine and Gilmore. So um, Pine and Gilmore, uh, wrote a book about um, uh, experiences becoming a popular uh, part of um, of what people wanted in business generally. And what they were talking about, th their explanation of why this was occurring is pretty much because we are becoming wealthier and more individually um, uh, uh, having more money um, in our society today. So societies are, are generally growing wealthier. Individuals have got more money. And therefore, in many Western countries, um, they uh, people have moved from uh, buying commodities such as rice or... Uh, uh, things which are the necessities. They um, those things in many Western countries, not for everyone, and certainly not you know there's inequalities around the world. But in many countries, the the basics of uh, life are pretty well met, and that allows people to then spend money on things that. Uh, they might, um, in the past, have made themselves. So just as in the past we may have grown our, our own food, now those things have become commodities and we buy them from other people. 
Similarly, uh, you know, I've been talking to some people in Indonesia and it would be quite common even now for people in some villages in Indonesia to make their own clothes. But in Western countries, those tasks, those um, activities have been outsourced. So now people will buy clothes uh, through the internet or in shops and things. But then a little bit later, um, things which we again would have done ourselves, like cooking our own food for dinner um, or cutting our hair or maybe even grooming our nails or something, um, things which were s services that we would have done for ourselves have become things which now we buy. So um, it's quite common. Uh, tonight um, I bought, uh, I, I, I made my dinner. That is, I rang up the, uh, the restaurant, ordered the food, went and picked it up and have had my dinner. So I've outsourced cooking. Many other things have been outsourced as well, hair cutting and so on, as I said. So that's why the economy of many countries is changing. And today in Australia, the largest sector of the Australian economy is the service sector, of which tourism is one part, but there are many other parts. Um, but see, the thing is, if you go to a restaurant to get your dinner some as a service, you might start thinking, and, and you do that a lot, let's say you go three or four times a week or even more, then the average service of getting some food and perhaps taking it home or sitting in a, in a diner somewhere becomes less interesting. And so then people start thinking about having an experience rather than just having food cooked for them. So um, you, people will start to think about much more experiential activities. I mean, uh, a way to start might be to go to a luxury restaurant where you would have, uh, in, in essence, a, a luxurious, luxurious restaurant is like... Um, food which is taken, transformed from nutrition to experiential. And, and so this idea that um, uh, food becomes a performance as well as nutrition, that's the sort of thing that might come in experience. Um, in a hotel, for example, it might be that uh, instead of just buying a bed uh, in a room, you have a themed hotel suite, which is like a jungle, perhaps, or something. I don't know. But but basically, at each of these stages, um, we have uh, uh, we we take for granted the previous stages uh, of development. So. Um, once you've eaten, once you've got enough rice, what do you do? Well, maybe you start looking to buy goods. Once you have enough goods, uh, you know, how many cars can you buy? Well, maybe you might have five, ten, but then after a while, having just having cars is not enough. You might then go to services. And so the idea is that today, we live in an experience economy. That was uh, what Pine and Gilmore talked about, where the thing that creates economic value, uh, or one of the things that creates uh, economic value, things that people want to buy, are intangible experiences. And of course, uh, Pine and Gilmore might talk about the next stage of society where people are interested in not just having an experience, but in some way transforming themselves. Perhaps um, 
experiencing a, having a spiritual experience or uh well i don't know um but but the 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 idea behind this whole idea of experience design is that more and more people are demanding or wanting or willing to pay for um more than just the basics and therefore you need to think about how you can add value to a service and create experience for people and so the idea of experience design is understanding the process by which we create valuable experiences for customers hmm. well of course this is not new uh let's think about do you know this one disneyland right so Disneyland is arguably a service, but it's more than that, isn't it? It's an experience where you come, you you get involved in this story. You you see symbols um, like Mickey Mouse, things which have a meaning to you, perhaps from your childhood, things which might be very uh, interesting and uh important to you 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 associate yourselves with these things and of course those things provide benefits to you psychological benefits which you're willing to pay for um, it might be that a mother takes children to uh, disneyland in order to allow the kids to have fun and excitement which she finds very valuable uh, kids find valuable as well. Or perhaps she's trying to create an experience where people have family togetherness. Now, these are all psychological outcomes. So if you want to understand experiences, you need to understand people's thinking, right? Uh, thinking um, so so this is the idea of uh, uh, consumer behavior is is one aspect of trying to understand uh, customers thinking I like to talk about um, a cognition and emotion and how those things are created and why we're involved in stories which goes a little bit beyond understanding people's behavior and requires you to think about the mental processes that our people are, are are involved in. So, um, how did how did how did um, what was Walt Disney thinking when he started to create uh, Disneyland? He was a storyteller. He certainly understood the power of symbols, and he was well ahead of his time in creating this experience economy ideas. But there are many people who may be involved in um, designing experiences. You know, if you're if you're a psychologist, um, if you're a uh, IT person, you might be thinking about the user experience of looking at a um, a computer screen or an app or something. If you're, you, you might be thinking about um, tourist experiences or aesthetics, the, the value of beauty. Um, you might be thinking about culture or um, experiential learning. That's interesting. That's, uh, that's the idea that people, adults, learn best when they are able to contribute to their learning um, employee experiences uh, pay the patient experience of a medical hotel uh, hospital for example so there's many different people um, architects IT people um, medical people who are, might be all thinking about designing experiences for their customers that's what architects do. They they do that by designing a space. But what they're trying to do, or at least the philosophy of architecture says, 
we're actually designing an experience for a person to live in. Um, but oh, that's wonderful. Um, what I have found in studying experiences is that, um, well, like any area of um, academic life, um, many different disciplines are used to study it. And if I, if I had any advice for uh, a person studying for a PhD or, or being an academic, uh, it would be to clearly understand your disciplinary perspective. What discipline are you using to study the phenomena, the topics that you're researching? And that's, of course, important then in terms of studying customer experiences, because there are two different ways of thinking about um, experiences. Uh, uh, there was a very good paper written by um, uh, Anna Claudia Campos from Algar University of Algarve, where she did a literature review on co-creation. And found that when people talk about the concept of co-creation, they look at it from a supply side, that is businesses co-creating a product, or a customer side, the involvement of the customer in that product. And the problem is, in the literature, all of those ideas are mixed up. So if you're trying to study an area, make sure you're at least clear whether you're studying experiences from a supply side, that is the de design of an experience, or from the customer viewpoint, the consumption of the experience, because they're quite different. And so if you are studying the design uh, from a management perspective, of course, you need to understand how to create it in terms of the, the uh, service scape or the experience scape, as they call it. The, you need to understand the tasks that need to be done, the interactions with people and how to schedule all those things. But you also need some understanding of the thinking that people have. And, and certainly you need, you need to understand why, what people are finding valuable and why. And that is where I, that's, that's my area of interest, um, the cognitive psychology of experiences. Now, if you're thinking, of, so, so this is where, if you want to study the cognitive psychology of experiences, then you need to understand cognitive psychology. Hmm, that's a bit of a problem because um, not many academics in business or in uh, tourism or in many area services adopt a cognitive psychological viewpoint. Uh, they might use a behavioral psychology viewpoint where they're not really interested in the mental processes that a people are, are, are using. They are interested in the outcomes, the behavioral outcomes that people and what they know uh, that people do. And, and what they do is they correlate aspects of the experience with um, the behavior that people undertake. And what they don't do is look at why the connection, what's happening in our brain when, when we are having an experience. Actually, and, and that brings me to the next thing. So once you start thinking about experiences, you realize that there are two different ways that you can study experiences. One is, uh, uh, Dr. Shah, we are having an experience now, right? So that is the, a conscious experience 
um, which you may or may not find satisfying. <laughs> okay, but that's the, that's the experience now. Very true. Then tomorrow you will remember some aspects of what I said. So then we have the remembered experience. Now, of course, these are connected. We we have we are having an experience now, and tomorrow some aspects of what my con our conscious experience is now will be remembered. Why? Why is it that only some things will be remembered and not others? Well, this is where it gets interesting, isn't it? We're talking about the formation of memories. Why? What forms memories? Well, I tell you, the, the short answer is if you want to get people to remember something, you get them emotional. Oh! Okay, perhaps I can sp surprise you that will tend to stimulate laying down of stronger memories. Okay, huh. so we can do some things and design some aspects of my experience now that will lead to things which are remembered tomorrow and so that when i say to you uh dr shah that presentation yesterday how did it go you say oh it was good typically hopefully that means that the things that you remember were there were enough things that you remember which were good which uh allows you to say yeah satisfied satisfied my needs or the needs of what i was expecting so What's an experience? An experience, there's two different things. We design a conscious experience, which we plan will become a well-remembered and pleasant experience. Okay, interesting. So let, let's take a, you know, take a, a, a something that people talk about. They talk about a customer journey. So. This is a, a, a sort of a diagram which tries to look at the experience of a customer in visiting a business. Okay, so if you look at the boxes over on the left hand side, you'll see uh, that there are um, uh, some backroom functions that the customer never really uh, interacts with. That might be the uh, IT system or something. But then, let's say this is a restaurant, there'll be certain things that the customer interacts with. There'll be some activities, some staff, there'll be the, the layout of the facility, perhaps there'll even be a theme to the restaurant or music or some intangible features. So the, all of those things are designed by the business. And on the right, on the right hand side, you see the customer. The customer journey, if you like, is the red line. So it begins perhaps by a person dreaming or planning about going to this restaurant. And importantly, in doing so, they people are often subconsciously identifying goals and benefits from the visit. We, we might call those expectations. And then we might book. And then what happens in the when we visit the uh, business is there'll be a series of events. We might call them scenes, like scenes in a movie. We might have the opening scene where we arrive at the restaurant and we're greeted by the waiter or something. Scene, uh, uh, scene two might be the choice of the food. Scene three would be the discussion, see event four, and those things happen, hopefully pleasantly, and then we leave. And we might then remember overall that 
the whole experience was good. Uh, we will have some memories and those memories along with the associated um, satisfaction become our remembered experience. Hmm, it's good. Now, interestingly, uh, this might give you some ideas about designing it. And one thing I always think about is if you're designing a, 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 an experience from a customer's perspective, you think about the theming of the events to make it into an interesting story for the customer, which allows them to meet their goals and receive benefits. So you might want to try and understand for your customers, well, what do they want to get out of this? Let's say your uh, the goal in going to a luxury restaurant is to impress your girlfriend. Hmm? Very important aim or objective. Now, how could the restaurant try and help design some events which support that goal because if they do then the outcome will be extreme satisfaction perhaps even delight with the service so that's what you're trying to do in terms of designing experiences let's now think about it from another perspective we said that there are two ways of thinking about um, experiences there's the remembered experience which we've talked about but each of these events or steps in the process might be remembered individually so and they will be more likely to be remembered individually if there is some emotion associated with them and Interestingly, if you understand how emotion is formed, one of the best ways of producing a positive emotion like happiness is to allow a person to achieve their goal. Right? And if you want to delight a person, you, you surprise them in the delivery of that goal. So um, if you can create an emotion at these different steps, then that will become a memory and it will then be part of your conscious experience, which will all be summarized at the end in terms of your remembered experience. So this is how a individual designed series of events, often themed, can create a remembered experience which is valuable and it's valuable because it um, uh, meets uh, provides you with benefits that you your expectations were based on so this allows us to think about the two different definitions of an experience um, so some people say Shadzel and Macintosh in the tourism literature, I think, say um, uh, an experience is an emotional, spiritual, psychological, or, or learning outcome. Therefore, they are thinking about the remembered experience. Other people say it's a mental transformation process. In that case, they are thinking about these steps and the production of emotion, memory, conscious um, experiences, which are, so this is a process, this is an outcome. Okay, very interesting, very interesting. So how do we go about designing one of these things? I, I, I love this photo. It reminds me of um, getting lost in the literature. So, if you if you start reading a um, any academic literature, you soon end up like this. Where the hell am I? Um, but uh, here's here's an idea, here's another way of oh here's a here's a sort of a structure for designing an experience, 
which relates to particular events. Okay. And the whole idea, this is why stories are so important. Stories are things that we are, as humans are used to experiencing. We're, we're always telling ourselves stories. We're learning about the world around us through stories. We make sense of things through stories. So if you want to design an experience, try and create a story for people. That's what a film is. That's what a movie is. It's a story. And you do it the same way. So you have a, a theme or a, let's say a, a, a type of story. Is it a romance? Is it a adventure? Is it uh, drama or so on? And you then think about the various steps in the journey, customer journey, as scenes in a stage, uh, scenes in a, in a play or scenes in a movie. And you do, you design the story so that it, establishes the the setting um, then you might uh, try and create a bit of drama or excitement and then you might leave people calm and happy at the end how do you do that well maybe you think about the customer as a character in a movie so so they they walk in uh, one of the things when a person walks into a restaurant or a hotel or other experiential area, you often have a sign, uh, some sort of symbols called the entrance statement. The entrance statement tells people you've arrived, you can relax, you're in the restaurant and now behave as expected of a person in a restaurant. Good. So you need to communicate that to people at the start then you might welcome them and you might introduce them through that welcome to the story that they're going to understand uh, that they're, they're going to participate in and of course that's what the waiter does when you go to a luxurious restaurant he welcomes you he might try and understand what your purposes are if he sees uh, a man and a woman by themselves, young, he might assume that this is a romantic dinner. So he will try and encourage uh, the story to be about romance. Anyway, so then you establish the situation, you provide symbols and create interest and involvement. You then go through a series of scenes. Um, there might be a peak of a time, uh, typically in a birthday, um, it's when the cake comes out and there's candles on the cake and everyone sings happy birthday. That's the climax. Uh, in, a, um, in a romantic dinner, it might be the dessert, which is sweet and delightful. I don't know. Anyway, so then... Uh, you come to the climax, then you finish the story. Um, there's a lot of co-creation. You're not just delivering this service to people. You are w working with the customer to create the emotions and the story. Uh, at the end, you might even provide some souvenirs for people to take home. That's good for memory. And they leave in a positive emotional state, happy, calm, or even, you know, uh, more aroused happiness, uh, delightful, delighted. And anyway, and then as, as after they leave, they then you have this outcome. So then uh, often at the end of this amazing story, people say, oh, how was your dinner? And you say, oh, that was nice, thank you. And they say, you're you happy, you're satisfied, and you say yes. But it, that idea of satisfaction doesn't s explain the complexity of what's happening. If you, want, if you want to understand what's happening in this experience, you just can't ask people if they're satisfied. You've got you to do more than that. So, 
so here's the idea that you design experiences using the, the uh, techniques of, in the same way that Steven Spielberg designs movies. Steven Spielberg does the same thing. He plots his stories. He has his music. He has the emotions that he wants from his um, audience. And so that's what you might do if you're designing an experience. And it, it would typically will have three steps. The, the introduction, perhaps some sort of confrontation or climax, uh, and then a resolution. Um, and it's a bit like uh, maybe a fantasy movie. Maybe not. It, it could be that in this experience you you try and get your customer to leave the real world and enter a fantasy where they can interpret the experience as being in a film, being in an experience. Uh, it's a romance, you know. So if you can do that, if you can get the involvement and engagement of the customer, then you have got a successful experience that you've designed. So um, same thing for a destination, um, uh, a place. Um, perhaps uh, if, if I think about um, uh, London, London has a character to it. It has a, it has a sort of s scenes or things come to mind, which when you think about London or New York or Marrakesh or Spain. And so there are some things that you might expect to experience if you go to one of these places. And so a tropical beach might be sort of associated with what? Uh, exoticness and adventure, or perhaps relaxation and luxury. I don't know. There's places can tell different stories. And what you got to know is what the motivations and goals of your customer are, and then fit the culture stories and symbols that of the destination to that. To that. So if, um, if you're trying to promote a place, a city, a suburb, a, a country, you might like to think about how. Uh, uh, how it could become a film. Um, and what are the symbols associated with the place? Lots of things to think about. So different types of experience outcomes from... So, so, so a place, a, typically a natural place, a forest, is calm and peaceful. And associated with restoration. But it can also be a place of adventure where you learn, you have an adventure and you learn about yourself. Theme park, maybe it's about emotional arousal, but it contributes to your self identity. Wellness, uh, it's about more about self. Well, it, so wellness can be done for your own purposes, or it can be done to impress other people. Which one? And transformation. Transformation, having a transformational spiritual experience is usually about self-identity and seeing yourself as developing as a person, perhaps. But again, not everyone thinks that way. You have to understand how your customers are doing. Um, there are different type of experiential outcomes from the same place. So you can have a setting. It's like having a stage. You can have a stage, but deliver two different plays. You can have a restaurant, but deliver two different outcomes. The important thing is to deliver the experience that your customers want. So that's about customization. That's about 
understanding your customer and emphasizing different um, parts or tangible and intangible elements of your experience to meet their needs. So, uh, and, and perhaps using co-creation. So working with your customer to encourage them to think one way rather than another. Anyway, um, his, his, uh, so co-creation of experiences in a tourism setting. Um, what about people experiencing how to grow crops, a rice, for example, or cooking classes? So instead of going to a restaurant to learn to eat food, you go there to learn about cooking. What about um, instead of buying apples or fruit, you actually get people to have an experience picking their own fruit? Or instead of just looking at dolphins or marine animals, you get to experience them in a responsible way. Uh, and in, in Australia, we have that, there, there are places where you can interact with turtles after they have laid their eggs in a, in a responsible way. This is a national park controlled by the government where people can watch the turtles laying and then perhaps under guidance touch them. Wonderful. So, um, how are we going, Dr. Shah? We, am I going okay? Yes, Prof. Carry on. We are enjoying your presentation. It's so lovely. Please carry on. Okay. All right. So, so one of the things I talked about before, and now we're starting to try and think about the processes that are occurring when we're having experience. And this is something which most people don't think about. <laughs> um, most of the things that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis or moment-to-moment -moment basis are experienced subconsciously. We, they occur to us, but maybe we're thinking about something else or maybe we are, it's just something that happens all the time and we're sort of on autopilot. There are many examples of that. For example, um, uh, uh, often beside a, uh, a sh at the at the cash register of a shop, they'll have lots of things that you can buy as an impulse purchase. That's because they're trying to capture you and n get you not to think about the purchase. It's just something that you do. So. In fact, most of the things that happen to us on a daily basis are not remembered and may not even be conscious. We may not be conscious of what's happening. So when I'm talking about experiences, I'm talking about things which are subconscious, important to us. They determine our behavior, but may not even be remembered. And then Assuming that we actually remember them, most of the things that occur to us um, that, that, that happen are ordinary things which are, um, are undertaken usually using low arousal scripts or routines. Um, they are usually things which are not particularly important to us. They need to be done perhaps, but... Uh, you know, when we're shopping, we might proceed, but not actually really be thinking much about what's happening. What we're talking about with experience design is moving those ordinary things to become extraordinary or to create extraordinary things which are unusual. So the things which are subconscious, not remembered. The things which are ordinary usually are not remembered. If you, but if you have something which is extraordinary, sometimes we say it's a memorable experience or a meaningful or even a transformational experience. These are the things that we remember. But the question is why? 
Why do we remember them? Can we explain why these things are remembered? Well, the characteristics of these things that are extraordinary are that they are often new and novel. They're things which we haven't experienced before. And they are usually things which have some meaning to us. Maybe they're goal congruent. They're, they're helping us to achieve some important goal. Or they are, uh, they are symbolic in some way, which is another way of saying they help us to achieve a symbolic outcome. Anyway, and those are the things which our brain spends more time processing consciously. We, be, we are actually conscious of the processing. They create arousal because they're novel and goal congruent. They create strong, stronger goal congruent uh, outcomes, which lead to emotion. And if you have something which is novel and meaningful and goal consistent, something that you want to happen, then you tend to have a stronger emotion, which of course leads to a stronger memory. So, and the, if it's strong memory, it may lead to changing the way our brain schema operate, which we would call transformational. So, what we're talking about then is design, if we're talking about the design of experiences to be remembered, then we want to make them novel, meaningful, goal congruent, emotional, and lead and therefore leading to memory. Easy. Right? Easy. So there are different um, you know, people have talked about um, experiences a lot. They talk about um, experiences being extraordinary, memorable. They talk about um, experience satisfaction. But I think satisfaction is simply a calm, positive emotion. Uh, customer value, you produce customer value through experiences by creating emotion and so on, and a story which people are involved in. Um, they talk about the experience quality, but that doesn't really help much. Quality is, is more of a um, cognitive thing rather than an emotional thing. Um, they, they talk about uh, some outcomes from experiences of different types. So you might end up with an experience which is transformational or, or produces happiness or leads to cre creativity, maybe, um, or creates attention restoration. Tension restoration is often attributed to a natural environment and is said to be recharging of our batteries of our mental batteries, but it doesn't actually work that way. Anyway, so let's now put it all together. Think about designing an experience. Well, the first step is to understand the customers. What are the customers bringing? What is their prior experience that defines novelty of the experience? What are their motivations and goals? And what is their understanding of the culture, stories, and symbols that you want to use in your experience? Then we have the actual experience itself. We have a stage, the service scape or the experience scape, where there are goods, tangible things, which are like props in a, in a uh, play. And we have intangible things like stories and symbols which are combined and interacted with by the customer who identifies the relevant stimulus for them. They don't notice everything. They notice relevant things. Perhaps you need to draw your, their attention to some things. You get an immediate outcome, which might be satisfaction or some emotion. Uh, well, sorry, immediate satisfaction, but maybe it's the the immediate outcome is feeling good, emotion. And then longer term, you have these memories and understanding that you've had some sort of value, perhaps even transformation. 
how do you design these things? Well, they're complicated. So you don't try and do it as a researcher. Right? The classic idea of a researcher trying to understand the customer, getting some insights, writing a report and producing it. When you're designing experience, you need people with different skills. You need architects or uh, um, artists or, or creative people, storytellers, as well as um, management people and so on. And you certainly need maybe to even involve customers in the design process. That will lead to a better um, experience. So we've done some of this work. Um, uh, we we did some work on trying to um, design experiences for Chinese visitors to a beach. Uh, there's a paper that you might want to read. It's in a book. It's a book chapter um, where we tried to work in a group across different disciplines to design the experience. We tried to understand both the management and the customer's perspective. Uh, we tried to collaborate and ensure collaboration between researchers and managers and try to get a bit of innovation and creativity into the process. And if you want to um, have a look at some of the material that came out, this is all on this website uh, for Tourism and Events Queensland. We designed some worksheets about experiential travel, designing experiential travel experiences. All right. Um, if we... If I have a little bit more time, Dr. Shaw, I'm going to talk a little bit now and move from the design part into the cognitive psychology understanding. Yes, Is that okay? Yes, Prof. Please go ahead. We have okay. unlimited time. Go ahead. Okay, please. thank you. So here we go. We're back now. This is where you're going to get really confused because this is wonderful. Remembering that as an academic, you should be trying to learn new things rather than just repeat the same old things all the time. So this is new. Uh, let's think about what we mean. What are the basics of cognitive psychology? Well, cognitive psychology is trying to understand how our brain works. And the assumption, the basic assumption that you have to agree to if you want to understand cognitive psychology is that it's your brain that determines mental outcomes and meaning. It's not the phenomena. If you go to a theme park and get excited, the theme park did not create your excitement. You created your excitement in your head because the theme park was appraised as being exciting for you. OK, so it, the first thing I want to say is that you can't say you made me excited. It's not like that. You make yourself excited right? and you can change how you view things. So an emotion, whether sadness or happiness, is created by your brain not by your situation. That's why you have people, two people in the same situation can have completely different outcomes because it's all in your head, not in the world around you. So another way of saying that might be um, beauty. You, you know this idea, they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's a, a proverb or something that, you, you uh, that they say in Australia. Well, that's true. Beauty is not the property of a painting. A painting is not beautiful. It is a property of how I think about the painting. Okay? Now, of course, if you're a sociologist or if you're an anthropologist, you might think differently. Or even if you're a behavioral psychologist, you might think differently. So if you're, but if you're a cognitive psychologist, you've got to think that it's all in your head because that's what these people study. 
and arguably it's demonstrable that it is in your head. Um, secondly, you have to get away from the idea that people are rational and think before they act. That's clearly not true. In fact, most of our life is determined by the emotions we feel, which are, and therefore we act on those emotions and then we rationalize after the fact that it was a logical thing to do. Hmm. So we got to understand emotions. And or, so I, a, a cognitive psychologist would say all decisions or perhaps 99.9% .9 of them, I don't know, um, and experiences are emotionally based. But emotions are subconscious processes which we're not aware of. We are aware of the outcomes of our emotions, which are feelings. But we're not aware of the emotional process that leads to feelings. Okay? Another thing you've got to believe is that emotions are rational. They're not irrational things that people will. They are the emotions that you are feeling is your subconscious appraising something based on your current goals and giving you some direction on how to proceed. Therefore, it's Emotions are a survival mechanism. And that's why sometimes if you start to feel a little bit uneasy, that's your subconscious mind appraising some danger, but not being a but not being able to clearly tell your conscious brain what it is. It communicates to you through your feelings. Oh, isn't that exciting? So this idea that you're f when you feel something, you are actually getting your subconscious mind providing you with information that your conscious mind is not aware of. And those feelings are guides to survival. That's why, imagine you were a caveman 40,000 years ago, and you might be afraid of going outside at night. That's because it's dangerous. You don't know why it's dangerous, but perhaps so your brain creates worry as a, emo, as a feeling based on the fact that your brain is appraising the situation as dangerous. Therefore, you, if you feel worried, therefore, you don't go outside. Therefore, you survive and have children, which means that emotions are a way, a, a mechanism for survival and create can contain lots of information for survival. And of course, now in modern life, we use that same information to understand what we like and dislike. So if we feel happy, that's a way for our brain to say, do this again. And if we feel unhappy, it's a way for our brain to say, uh-uh, try something else. And of course, there's problems with all of that, but that's the general idea. So when you talk about being calm, that's a low, usually that means it's a low arousal positive emotion. And satisfaction, as I said, I think is a low arousal positive emotion, which means as an experiential outcome, it's so-so. It means you're not getting strong emotions. Um, emotions work because of this thing called appraisal, which is subconscious. And the way it works is that your, your mind creates a picture of the world around it in its head in, in your head and then it looks at that and it says is this picture unusual in any way is it a situation where my goals are likely to be fulfilled 
and some other things. And depending upon the joint appraisal of the situation on those dimensions and only those dimensions, not anything else, the brain then communicates to you through feelings of its assessment, of its appraisal. That's called cognitive appraisal theory. And I strongly suggest that, uh, that uh, I, I believe that that's um, a very useful theory. But so, so basically the sequence is an event, a stimulus that you see can create some arousal and reasoning. I'm not sure about that, but certainly you get an emotion, which then is an outcome. So, novelty, if you see something unusual, like your child walking for the first time, you would feel, and remember, this is something that the mother wants, they really want their child, and the child walks for the first time, then you will experience delight, you'll experience happiness. Right. That's because you're appraising this event on novelty and goal congruence and goal importance. And if you go out with a person and you're thinking, why am I here? This is not meeting my goals. This guy is clearly not the man for me. Then you start to not pay much attention and you start to th and and perhaps you start to communicate to this person that he that they're not achieving any uh interest okay so again um the more you can create memory through emotion and meet understand people's goals the more you're able to create strong emotion which we would then say was a wonderful experience. That's what you're trying to do in experience design. Okay, so there you go. Um, that's my talk about experience design. Uh, and I hope you found it useful. I'll stop sharing and then we can have some questions. Let me just yes. see how I, I stop sharing. So back to you, um, Dr. Shah. Thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation, Prof. It was so wonderful to see your content and the way you started was so interesting. And I was uh, highly engaged in your presentation. <clears throat> uh, Prof, I like the way you started it, that the conscious uh, experience and then the remember uh, experience. And then you showed a very wonderful picture, which I liked a lot. Uh, that you are lost in literature review. It was so wonderful picture. Mm. And thank you very much for uh, including this cognitive part because it was very essential part. And I loved uh, you explained the way our brain actually create the situation for us. And you give a very nice analogy and examples that uh, uh, two person at the same situation can perceive in a very different way because uh, there are different things and uh, particularly the role of the emotions and the role of uh, novelty itself. And this is what, uh, Prof, I would say that this is the actually science. It is organized and connected. It is systematic and uh, people are taking it in a random way. So very well explained. And uh, today I, I learned a lot new things uh, from you, Prof. Thank you very much. Uh, it was so uh, uh, wonderful content. and rich content i would say because uh, these are the things which uh, hardly people teach uh, because it's a, a kind of uh, not, not traditional content and uh, you have mixed up uh, so many wonderful uh, exp uh, expert and genius they will give you 10 20 books ex examples and things and they will make it more simple but you did it so wonderful prof uh, thank you uh, should we start with the first question please do please okay <laughs> yes uh, prof our first question is related to the last uh, our uh, webinar which was on uh, systematic literature review that person has emailed us five times that to please keep my question 
and then you can ask the rest of the questions. So we start with the first question. Uh, one uh, person has uh, asked about that uh, he wants to ask the question that is that uh, please guide whether the general public for example he says that, that uh, if someone published five journal research article with empirical evidences and another person published five review articles so which one is considered more better or is it the same uh, yes uh, your opinion prof Hmm. Um, in 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 my opinion, a good literature review is better than an em empirical paper. Typically, a good literature review will receive more citations than an empirical paper. That's not always true, but. But it has to be a good literature review. And I think the key issue is um, what is a good literature review? And there's a, there's a tendency these days for people to do descriptive systematic literature reviews which report the number of people publishing in an area or the number of papers each year or these things. And they're not uh, they're not providing a significant contribution to the literature. So, on the proviso that your literature review provides some new conceptual framework or some uh, reconciliation between two different stream, a stream of literature which has got two different competing ideas, or some new typology which hasn't been thought about. As long as you do something like that, then a literature review is wonderful. Um, most empirical papers are repetitious uh, examples of things which have been done before, especially if you're looking at things like satisfaction or concepts which have been well used. So. Um, in my opinion, a literature review is good, but the proviso is it's got to be a good one. Thank you. Very nicely said. Again, the quality matters a lot. So you have to work uh, in a very good way so that you can have the, a wonderful piece of work. So, of course, uh, thank you very much. Prof, we have another question. Uh, they want to ask that. Uh, please clarify the issue. I'm the PhD student that... Uh, there's a misconception that the qualitative research is superior to quantitative research. Uh, what do you think, Prof? Is it true or how about if we have the mixed method? Yes, your opinion on that, please. Mm. Uh, two points. Firstly, um, uh, so empirical research, uh, uh, so think about the process by which academic theory and practice advances. You start off with phenomenological observations. You see something, you give a name to it. You might identify that there are different types of these things that you've just named. You then start to see relationships between an antecedent and the thing that you've named and a consequence. So you start to see relationships then you start to uh, see, uh, um, you start to be able to predict um, a particular phenomena based on an antecedent or so on. That's how, um, that's how, in my opinion, um, academia advances. Although some people who are social scientists may say quite rightly that process doesn't apply but anyway we'll, we'll see um then um typically then qualitative research might identify the phenomena and 
so it, it, it identifies something that people haven't really thought about before or discussed before. Um, and then once it's identified and you start to understand it, then you might start to do quantitative research. So that's a typical process. In that case, it, the qualitative research might be more significant because it's new. But it depends a little bit on the type of qualitative research you're doing. Um, in that grounded theory, perhaps, is a type of qualitative research, but it only seeks to explain a phenomena which is very restricted, very uh, is happening here, but it may not happen over there. Because in grounded theory, everything's interrelated. You need to study this particular area and you can't generalize between this area and that one. So in that particular case, you can do qualitative research, but you're really just studying the same phenomena, but in a different context. Okay. So. What does all that mean? It means to me that, oh, oh, oh and then, of course, um, quantitative research can prove or disprove things. So uh, you, you can't really say one's better than another. One may be more useful in a particular research literature um, context Are you, and and so um, if you can define an area and justify that it hasn't been studied before then you might justify qualitative research if your the purpose is to test existing theories then you're using quantitative usually not always but then the the other part of the story I've forgotten. I forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, mixed method. So if so, one trend in journals these days is that they like multiple studies. So often, um, in fact, all of the PhD students who I supervised, well, not all of them, but uh, the majority of them would do a qualitative study and then a quantitative to achieve. One was to test an idea, see it applies or see, just understand the phenomena. And then you might want to quantify something. Um, increasingly, so, so you, can, you can say that you're doing two studies, qualitative and quantitative. Increasingly, journals want multi-study papers because they're saying that's better evidence. So um, doing a mixed method can be seen as a way to get your paper more easily published because you can say to the journal, you've done a multi-method or a, a, a mixed method approach. But again, to me, it all comes back to the significance of your findings. There have been some wonderful papers. I think I may have, I'm not sure if I mentioned this last time, wonderful papers where people have done a qualitative study and changed the way a discipline thinks about a situation. Uh, typically, that was when sociologists were doing early work on networks and they did qualitative studies, uh, case studies and things. Uh, and but really changed, you know, the way that people think about maybe transfer of information across groups of people, for example. So um, that would be a wonderful case study and you see them. You'll also see extremely technically good, but also insightful quantitative studies. The question always is, what's the contribution of your paper? And can you can you prove that you've you've got this insightful finding mm -hmm. yes bro very nicely said once again and uh, in the last sentences i liked a lot 
uh, it's all about the significance and the contribution uh, that you are making to the field and to the world. Uh, yes, of course, in the previous session, you also mentioned there are some multiple qualitative studies which are very great. So indeed, it depends on the significance. Prof, we have one another question which is very much uh, interesting. Uh, they want to uh, ask that Prof, uh, while creating the uh, remembrance, uh, uh, remember experience, how do you see the role of emotional intelligence and intellectual skills? Do they correlate with each other? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So emotional intelligence. Um, well, I suppose the, the question is what we mean by emotional intelligence. Um, I think, I think emotional intelligence is um, a way of saying that a person has in the past experienced and learned to deal with um, emotions they may feel. So the, uh, that's a sort of uh, learning, which may be, uh, you know, sort of by analogy, a form of intelligence. Okay. It's something that's useful, something that you've learned and there's skills involved that you then apply to solve problems. Um, but I don't think, uh, uh, I, th I think a, I, uh, in, in cognitive psychology, it would be called, it would be called, um, uh, so in, in, in the process, uh, in, in the way, in the process by which um, uh, emotions are elicited and then processed, there's two stages. There's the uh, production, um, the elicitation of an emotion, which is then re-examined for its appropriateness in that situation. Okay, so imagine, forget about emotional intelligence. Imagine that you are um, in a extremely difficult situation, and you feel extreme fright so you feel fright or worry or something but then you realize that that's not going to help you and you need to change the way you think to be you know not so frightened and more trying to achieve some goal all right so that's a process of reappraisal that happens after an initial emotion is elicited and that can be learned, you know. The, so, in some situations, people um, learn not that it's inappropriate when they're feeling unhappy to cry, for example. Now, is that emotional intelligence? I don't know. Um, emotional intelligence might be to see someone from another culture and in and be initially be afraid but then have had experience or training enough to know that there's no need to be frightened right. so it's a reappraisal of your emotion that's what i think emotional intelligence is and uh i think it comes through experience and you learn it and just as you learn other skills in terms of dealing with your thoughts. Uh, so a cognitive psychologist would say there is a phenomena called emotional intelligence, but they would explain it in a different way to the way that it's normally discussed in the business literature, for example. Yes, very nicely said, Prof, once again. Thank you very much. Uh, Prof, we have one, one another question, which is a very interesting one. Uh, this person belongs to the industry. He's working in the industry. He wants uh, your expert opinion that, uh, uh, Prof, guide me when is the right time to do a PhD? Or uh, it should, uh, uh, when should one start PhD after having so many working experience or one can start immediate after 
uh, finishing the masters and get enrolled in the P phd so what is your opinion on that yes please mm. yeah so i think the first question before deciding when to do it is to ask yourself why you want to do it so um uh there are many reasons for doing a phd typically people want to develop themselves but sometimes people see it as a career change and a job, okay? So they see it as a way of getting into academic life. That's probably not a good thing to do, N not a good reason to do a PhD. I think a PhD is designed to encourage you to develop as a person and become uh, perhaps a more uh, uh, engage in a different type of thinking process, a more structured thinking process. Um, so uh, in terms of when you should do it, though, assuming you're doing it for self-development, um, my wife uh, uh, completed hers last year when she was 25. Well, let, let's say she wasn't 25. She was older than 25. I can't say how old she was, but um, retired, let's say. So she did it when she was retired because she wanted to develop um i did mine when i started when i was 40 so i had previously worked in industry and i thought that i knew because i had worked as a research manager in a business in two businesses three and had staff and conducted market research and then also so i thought i knew what research is all about and i thought i'd get into uh, academic life because I'd teach people a few things about, you know, obviously they don't know them if they're not in business and found that it's a completely different way of thinking and develop myself and enjoyed it. But most of my life has been about learning new things and enjoying learning new things. So I suppose the question, um, so then there's the people who um, finish their undergraduate to a master's and then do a PhD. And typically that was the usual way to do your PhD. And it, there, it was a sort of a progression. Um, and that's there's still a lot of that. The, the problem I have with that is that I do think that um, you can get too caught up in the theory and not understand enough about the dis of the the topic area that you're studying like management or business or something if it's an applied area if it's a scientific area well maybe that's different you need to continue your studies but i but for me if i um i think a, a well let me ask dr shah have you when did you do yours yes bro uh, I completed my master and then I immediately took uh, admission in the uh, PhD. But meanwhile, I was, I was working as part time. Uh, so it was a good experience because uh, uh, we, we, our mind was fresh and we were engaged in the master's research activity, thesis, publication. And then I went to University of Malaya. Uh, but I would second your uh, own opinion as well that uh, uh, we should rephrase the question and that should be asked you why you want to do a phd that is more important than uh, when to do a phd because what is the aim is more important uh, sometimes people uh, as you mentioned that sometimes people do it just because to shift to the academia that is a different aim but if your aim is to uh, gain the knowledge the aim is to give back to the society in terms of contribution and uh, discovering of new knowledge and things like that so then, of course, uh, the objective and the aim is a, uh, matters a lot while doing your PhD. Mm -hmm. That's right. I, I, I think that um, if, you, if you want to become rich, <laughs> um, then you don't do a PhD. Uh, if you want to, if you love learning and new ideas, then you should do a PhD. If you think that an academic career is a job it's going to give you money then don't do it because uh, you'll soon find that there's more to academic life than just you know the it will become boring for you 
because the things that drive an academic, uh, you know, are um, the challenges, the learning, the doing new things all the time. And if you're not interested in doing that, as a surprising number of academics are not, um, then, you know, you're just in the wrong, you're in the wrong job. Yes. Um, uh, I do, so in an applied area, I do think it's important to, if you're teaching, to have some experience, um, because otherwise you're just telling people what you read in a book and there's no sort of judgment or assessment of the information. And that's where you can drift off into academic uh, confusion. Um, there's a couple of other pragmatic things. Um, so you're you're a young man, Dr. Shah, and so you, you've done your your PhD, and then you've got a fair time to become a professor and to publish and to explore an area in depth. If you do it later in life. So I finished mine when I was 44. So I was in a big hurry. I had the reason I published so much is because if I didn't, you know, I, I had half the time in my career as an academic that you did, that you have, because I, I, uh, I finished at 44. I retired at 62, and so I had what, what's that? 16. Is it, how long is that? Um, Anyway, 18 years or something. So I had to cram everything into 18 years, and that put a lot of pressure on me, um, which uh, I enjoyed, but I found demanding. Um, but that that's why I've done so much in a fairly short period of time. Other people, if they start young, can if you like, amortize the cost of a PhD over a longer period of time. And hopefully, if they can stay motivated and interested, really get into depth in some areas and become a professor. Typically, though, to become a professor takes 10 or 15 years. That's why I had to publish like mad in order to get to a professor position before I retired. So... There's some other pragmatic things about the stage of life. My wife, my wife has just finished her PhD. She's got, she's driven. She's she's got her um, a research fellow a fellowship for her first year that she's got, which would be quite normal for a PhD student in some areas. But she's got, you know, arguably five years in her career before she is going to retire. So, you know, so there's some other stuff about the point of time in which you do you do your your um uh your PhD to get a reward, to get a payback for the effort and loss of income that you suffer when you're doing a PhD. Perfectly said prof and that's what uh, I liked a lot uh if you are inclined towards the PhD, uh, you must be uh, a knowledge seeker and you should uh, having the uh, learning capabilities. If you are a learner of new things and trying to get the new knowledge, then of course the PhD and the academic life is very good. And uh, wonderful uh, prof has uh, already given you a wonderful explanation for that. Uh, prof, we have one another question which is again similar and related to it. Uh, that's the last question as well. Uh, since you are the leader, people follow you, You whatever you say, that impacts a lot and people get motivated. So they want to know that, uh, Prof, how do you keep yourself motivated in this research journey? What was your source of motivation and what is your source of motivation in this research journey? Can you share your thoughts on that, please? Hmm. Look, um early oh well first of all you know it it's um um i i would get uh, in the early days i would get a reward a, a personal emotional benefit from having a paper published 
right? So early on, publication of a book chapter or a, or a um, paper was very rewarding for me. Uh, after a while, I became more interested oh, in publish, continuing to publish, but trying to do something new and different. And so it was more about distinguishing myself uh, by having a particular field of expertise, perhaps. Um, and then most recently, the thing that has, uh, that I have found motivating is to try and share this knowledge of, um, cognitive psychology, which is a new area and I think has got lots of application in business management generally uh, tourism and stuff so so the things that motivated me changed a little bit um i i also i, I, I like learning something or seeing something le learning solving a problem I've always liked solving problems. I don't know why. Why on earth would you want to do that? But uh, I find solving problems good. I enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> but motivation, you know, um, I, over the years, I've had some pretty horrendous feedback about some of the papers and some of the, uh, you know, journal article reviewers are terrible. Uh, and this is where, you, this is what I say, they do not make you unhappy. You make yourself unhappy. You can look at the reviews from a person, a reviewer, and feel sad or calm or even, you know, some other thing. It, it, it's all about reframing or framing the feedback that you get in a way where you see the positives. Does that make sense? Uh, and so that that's just, you know, you might call it emotional intelligence or something. It's about um, realizing that, um, you know, it, I, I think the thing is to enjoy it, you know, to try and enjoy what you're doing and uh, and but also break the big job of writing a paper or or having a career or doing your PhD down into a series of things, parts, and then just achieve them bit by bit and just keep going. And if you do that, you will get to the end. Mm -hmm. Yes, Prof. Very nicely said once again. And uh, I loved your the way you explain it. It's about uh, reframe and frame. How do you see the feedback and uh, enjoy what you do? Your emotional intelligence and all these things will play an important role for your motivation. Uh, so nicely said. Uh, I was really enjoying your whole presentation, and I love the way you uh, give the examples and the analogies and all these things. So wonderful, Prof. And that's what uh, we say that the this is the beauty of the. Uh, expert and you are the leader in this field and in such a short span of time you achieved a lot you published a lot you contributed a lot to the society and to the field uh, which is so commendable thank you very much prof what you are uh, it's really amazing to have you people are people like you are the real contributor uh, prof one thing which we ask our guest uh, as well last time you have given the message but again uh, the people who are watching for the first time, uh, please your message to them as a teacher, researcher, trainer, learner, professional, and educator. Yes, please. Uh, so the audience are people who are academics or doing their PhD. Is that generally who they are? Yes, yes Prof. Uh, the people who are in academics particularly. Oh, well, you got the best life in the world. Gee whiz. 
<laughs> You're the yeah. luckiest people. You've got the opportunity to play with ideas, but also you've got the opportunity to use those ideas to um, to benefit society. And so academics have got a lot of freedom if they want to take it, right? And if you want to take it and can and be energetic and have a direction, you can achieve whatever you want, right? Either in society or in academic life or something, or even in the teaching and changing people, uh, students. So when, when, I was, when I was working in business, I always felt a little bit constrained because I had to do the tasks that were set to me. But as an academic, I'm sure you've got people who are in charge of, but hopefully you can get to a stage where you set your own tasks. And I think that's, uh, you know, set your own goals. And that's the exciting thing about being an academic. So set good goals. Yes, very nicely said once again. And that's the beauty of the academics, uh, that you work and you come up with any idea and you can work and you can enjoy your journey. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Prof. Since you have the experience of both the industry and the academia, you have reached to the zenith of uh, both. Uh, so that's why what you say is has uh, a lot of background and a lot of experiences are there. Uh, no doubt we also enjoy the same luxury of being in academics that uh, we come up with the new ideas and we let the world know about it and trying to uh, create any significant or contribution. So... At the end, I would say that, yes, indeed, experience design is a scientific process and you need to understand it uh, while creating and uh, the remember uh, experience. So do follow the distinguished guest speaker uh, through his research work and you can email him for further learning and guidance. Uh, he is very generous and always ready to help the people. Moreover, wonderful explanation, a wonderful content, uh, which the prof has already elaborated, will help you to learn and understand regarding the research uh, uh, experience design. So thank you very much once again. Uh, uh, that's all we have time for today. Thank you again, Prof. Dr. Noel Scott. And also I would like to thank our audience who joined us. If you have any additional questions about the information shared today, you can uh, email us or you can connect to the speakers directly through his email or social media account. Uh, thank you all for uh, your support and liking our sessions. Stay tuned because an amazing sessions are on the way. Please do not miss any session. Till next session, take care of yourself. Bye.